All right, everybody, Minwax Munchkin back with another video. First and foremost, as I usually do, Mike, Matthew, Ewing, Larry Hoken, Bartley Man, Hardly Trying, Rogor, Jared Henderson, Kelron, Suburban Hell, Frank Fan, Albert Quack, Aiden Hart, Dark Sin, Gary Kors, Brad Oldham, Joel Siel, and Moten, Sean, Guys, Manozzi, Stefano, Clay Adequa, Zeb McCubbin, Nathan James, Primal Bass, Booze, Bitten B, Kyle Shikes, Trevor Green, Gaston Ramirez, Jordan Smith, Bassett, Lloyd, Lord Gazdak, Jeremy Siroy, Michael Tyle Hooser, Inacio Neto, Maligant Manuk, Anthony Du, Devin Yak, Twain Hudgens, Lunatic Dragon. Thank you for your continued support, all of you new and old patrons. If you would like to see your name on this list, and if you would like to enjoy uh, additional perks by being the patron of this channel, uh, you're always welcome to go and pledge into the Magical Secrets tier. As you can see, even this very video, which I... He released the first part of yesterday is already uploaded there so you can always download all of my notes and files that I use in these videos that said uh, I would like you I would like to invite you once again if you are interested in playing in my online campaign which goes from level one, level 1 to level 20 it's called Melendor Chronicles Undoing of Oderon it's a homebrew campaign um, I would invite you to enter your uh, details into this form, which will be linked down below in the description, together with some more highlights from my already running uh, campaign, which is already like four or five months in, if I'm not mistaken, and a little bit more details about my world as well. With that out of the way, now on to the main meat of this video. Basically, this is the second part um, of the build that I first talked about yesterday in this video. So, if you want to know like the short overview, the gist of the build, uh, go ahead and check out my video from yesterday. It's also going to be linked down below in the description. And uh, if you are new to the D&D 5th edition, if you are new to the hobby in general, and would like to play something like this this video might be then uh, a little bit better for you because well i will go into many more details uh, than i go in the first video so uh without repeating what i talked about in the first video which primarily revolved around uh, basic characteristics and key features core features spells and characteristics of the build I would like uh, to jump right into the race, so first and foremost, obviously, as you can see, the point buy spread, it's pretty standard for a min-maxed build like this, pretty much dump wisdom and strength. You can choose to increase your wisdom up to 10, because charisma is not really that important to you, other than multi-classing into a warlock, but... Um, Honestly, 10 or 8 doesn't really that make make that much of a difference, so I usually like to see even numbers in my own case, so that's why I make, made it this way. Now, High Elf as a race obviously gives you Dexterity plus 2, also gives you Intelligence plus 1. Um, you gain Dark Vision up to 60 feet, Perception Proficiency, uh, Fey Ancestry, all of that stuff that all Elves in 5th edition have. The main trait that we, you, all of us interested in this type of character, are interested in is the trance, which obviously uh, it allows you to gain the benefit of the shore of the long rest in just four hours. Now, if you if you played the game for any amount of time, you would know that in order to long rest, which basically gives all of your long rest dependent features, such as such as slots or all other racial or class features, you do need to spend at least six hours of sleeping and then two more hours of light activity such as maybe reading a book or keeping guard just in case somebody or something decides to ambush you or your party. In terms of elves, they only need to spend half of that time uh, in this semi-conscious trance meditative state where uh, they are still kind of you know, they are obviously not sleepy, they are not sleeping because they don't need to sleep, but they are obviously less less aware of their surroundings and all of that stuff, and obviously they need to spend that time like as a downtime activity. But the the main benefit of this trait is that it allows us, it allows you 
to spend four hours of, of, of the later half of half of the long rest, which is gonna be the four additional hours that everybody else in your party is resting, you know, sleeping, I don't know, maybe even some light activity as reading books. You can just spend it doing some active work, you know, casting spells, whatnot. In this particular case, this is going to allow us to have many more uh, fun, fun little elixirs from the alchemist. But more on that soon. Obviously, you gain elf weapon training, additional cantrip and plus one language, which... Honestly, this can be anything you want it to. Uh, that's why I didn't really go into specific one, because... Uh, it depends on your party composition, depends on what you want, depends on what you, what kind of character you really, you really want to play. Maybe you want to take Minor Illusion, but also you can take Mage Hand or stuff like that. And obviously language, that's just... I mean, there are language, there are all sorts of languages, so you might just pick one that fi that fits your particular character the best. Now, in terms of the background... I would say uh, that obviously a uh, house agent makes the most sense. Why? Because we are playing an alchemist and we need as many tool proficiencies as possible. You also gain investigation skill proficiency. Persuasion is also going to be semi-relevant if you... I mean, obviously, going back to the ability score, uh, kind of like the point by... The charisma is 14, which is a plus 2, so that tied with the proficiency bonus is going to allow you to have a slightly higher um, persuasion than you would necessarily have with some other character. Also, um, you gain the two tools in this particular case. I mean, House Jurasco makes the most sense. Um, you can pick any of these, but just like in terms of theme and even mechanically, it's probably the one that makes the most sense, and uh, yeah, I mean, with these with these two proficiencies, even from level 1, you can craft acid, potions of healing if your DM allows it, depending, you know, it depends on the DM, and uh, stuff like that, but uh, starting equipment also, obviously, it's kind of important because you gain 20 gold pieces, most backgrounds give you 5 to 15, in, in case of alchemist, Alchemists kind of need a lot of gold at the beginning because they gain a lot of these tool proficiencies and they don't necessarily gain the tools that come with the proficiencies. So you need to buy a lot of tools at the beginning and some of those tools for level 1 characters actually cost quite a bit, relatively speaking, right? In terms of this role, I mean, you can be anything. I would probably go for something, something like research and development, but... I mean, look, you can go for covert operations for all I care, you know. And obviously you gain these house connections as a feature, which kind of makes sense. You are a house agent. You should gain at least some perks and benefits of uh, belong belonging to such type of work organization, right? Now, this is primarily tied to Eberron setting um, on its own. Obviously, if you are playing in some other setting, namely Faerun, which is considered still like the primary... D&D 5th edition setting, these houses don't really exist, but this is something that you can just talk with your DM, obviously ask a DM whether you can combine some other tool proficiencies or, or whatever fits your idea behind the character, obviously. This can be flavored in ways that don't necessarily mandate that you have to take this particular combination of tool proficiencies and all of that stuff. I just think that this kind of background, even if you customize, modify it, Offers you the most bang, of bang for the buck because obviously tool, prof two, two tool proficiencies is uh, something that you clearly are going to benefit from. In terms of feats, I wouldn't really go with anything myself. But Warcaster does make sense because advantage on concentration, constitution saves is always relevant for any spellcaster, you know, when you take damage. Since uh, you're already proficient in con saves from the alchemist you gain uh, constitution save proficiency, you only, c I mean, it's okay, It's it can definitely work on its own, but uh, if you just like casting spells and concentrating on them without losing concentration, this is pretty much the only feat that I would consider for this build. Um, however, if you ask me, focusing on intelligence instead makes maybe even more sense, because three of your higher level features rely on your intelligence score, and therefore your intelligence modifier to be as high as possible. And 
All of that said, kind of let's de delve into this alchemist uh, subclass of the artificer. Obviously, the core features of the class, the hit points, the starting proficiencies, the equipment, uh, all of that is pretty much the same for uh, all ar artificers out there. I would, uh, I would probably start out with, not sure why I picked two hand axes, probably I'm gonna start with the uh, long crossbows or short bows because they, those actually are the most expensive ones and you do need to eventually sell them because, well, there's this kind of a weird thing with alchemists or, well, actually all artificers that they start out with thieves tools instead of tinkers tools for whatever reason. I guess it makes sense because for lower level characters it gives you some kind of a starting progression which you have to work towards before you collect all of these tools. But um, yeah, buying actually Tinker's tools cost I think like 50 gold, so and you start out with 20 from your background, so this is definitely something that you have to consider how fast can you get your Tinker's tools. Uh, primarily because you have to get this magic, like obviously at level 1 you get magical tinkering and in order to use magical tinkering you must have tinkers tools or other artisans tools in your hand. Now granted you can have other artisans tools from some other backgrounds but in the long term I think it's better to go with house agent background as I've already covered because you gain two, two tool proficiencies and eventually you are gonna buy Tinker's tools, you're gonna get your hand on these other artisan's tools that you get proficiencies in and uh, you know all of that stuff. In terms of the third proficiency, artisan tool proficiency of your choice, I would go for brewer supplies. I mean you can pick anything but in terms of alchemy, alchemist come like the theme of the alchemist, I think that's the most fitting one on top of the ones that you already have and will get. Um, you can definitely pick other ones, but that's just something that makes the most sense to me. I mean, this is not something that's really that important, if you ask me. Um, obviously, skills and all of that stuff is already uh, listed on the on in this file, so you can uh, read that. The magical tinkering is kind of like you don't start out with tinkers tools, as I said, so you should be able to scrape enough gold and buy them probably right away by just selling some of your gear that you start out with uh, and after that this seems like a ribbon feature on the surface but it is a literal, literal gold mine for creative players and out of the box thinkers especially on lower levels where you don't really have that many spells you don't have any particulars like uh, features and this is the one that provides a lot of these little seemingly low powered benefits perks but they can be used in ways that are creative and that's like features like these are something that i always like to see on characters even though that they are more on the side on the, of the ribbon feature you also obviously gain spell casting feature you are a half caster based on intelligence you have the only class the only official class in the game so far that can replace cantrips is uh, artificer as you can see and obviously also gain ritual casting and on top of that uh, reddit is uh, <laughs> um, ruining my focus so yeah basically you gain the spell casting ability intelligence ritual casting uh, a lot of spells and obviously you prepare spells on top of that now there's this whole paragraph somewhere in here about how your way of casting spells is probably radically different than all the other spellcasters in the game and it makes sense i mean you need tools or magical item infusions that you can make yourself to cast spells so here it's kind of described i won't go too deep into it but obviously the intent behind the spell casting of artificers is that you kind of flavor the way you cast spells in whatever way you see fit uh, and however much your imagination, I don't know, I'm not gonna say allows you, but obviously how much are you willing to let your imagination run wild, right? So that's it for the spell casting. Infuse item level 2 feature, which uh, you get, well, at level 2, right? Um, you can do all sorts of combinations with these infusions to further di di diversify your, your role in a party. Now, 
you start out with four infusions that you know but you can only have two of them active and as you progress through levels you learn more of them eventually after you hit level nine of artificer you will be able to have three of them active and six known but i'm gonna talk more about those a little bit uh, later now the right tool for the job is pretty much uh, money like saver at lower levels because by level 3 you might not necessarily even get enough gold to buy all the tools that you're proficient with and this will definitely save you a few dozen gold pieces at the beginning as you'll be able to just make the tools you haven't bought yet but unfortunately it's not really that relevant for um, you know that relevant at later levels because um, first and foremost, after a while you get enough gold to buy all the tools that you're proficient with. So the only tools that you kind of can make or even it's it makes sense to make are the ones that you're not proficient with. So in a way this kind of is good on lower levels and almost useless at higher levels. Even though still you can produce tools and use tools that you're not proficient with. That just means you're not adding your proficiency bonus when you roll a, a d20. Um, it's not as relevant regard in general because for the type of support character you're going after, tools are not really your primary focus anyway, right? And uh, yeah, so basically at level 3 you also get your Artificer Specialist and that obviously means you become a full-fledged Alchemist at this point. You gain additional tool proficiency and if you ask me I would pick glass blower tools because you already have alchemist supplies anyway. So why not pick something that's gonna enable you to make your own uh, wires, tubes and flasks made out of glass when you, you know, instead of buying that stuff. So buying the stuff usually costs more than creating it depending on the DM campaign economy, all of that stuff. There's too many variables there but it should at least be more um, accessible, at least on, on those lower levels, to make your own equipment instead of relying on, you know, just buying them or finding them in the world. So, yeah, that's definitely, I mean, it's not something that's critically important, but it might be in some in some situations and circumstances, right? Um, you also gain your, uh, your alchemist spells. Now, these spells are always prepared for you on top of the ones you already prepare yourself. Healing Word gives you a bonus action option and is only slightly worse due to less spell slots. It's a 1d4 plus your intelligence modifier. Healing. Now, Ray of Sickness uh, damage doesn't scale well, but the poison condition is always worth spending a slot. So, it's definitely something that you're probably going to rely on, at least on lower levels. Flaming Sphere is cool, but... Um, you know, it's definitely something that it's usually better than Melv's Acid Arrow because, well, I mean, Flaming Sphere is a concentration that lasts for a while and Melv's Acid Arrow only, it's, it's a one-use type of spell, so most likely you're gonna be dealing more damage with Flaming Sphere, especially at lower levels, but Melv's Acid Arrow does have maybe a little bit dem better damage potential at higher levels because it's a less resisted damage type. Acid is le re less resisted than fire. Uh, gaseous form is kind of like a panic button mobility option uh, type of spell, you know, you gain some resistances, you can go below doors or stuff like that. Mass healing word, I mean, it's a mass type of healing spell, so it's better on clerics because they get it at level 5 compared to you who get it at level 9, but any type of mass healing that can get multiple characters up from uh, from the zero hit points and bonus action is gonna be good. So it definitely doesn't hurt either. Now, at level 3, the main feature that you're interested in, Experimental Elixir, uh, the core feature basically of this character concept, uh, is basically reads as following. So one or two free random ones that you get after every long rest are a hit and miss, right? So at level 3 you get one, one random one and at level six you get two random ones from this table now sometimes you might get a good one sometimes you might get a bad one or less useful one let's call it like that i'm never going to call any of these bad i just think some of these are better than the others right uh you choose the ones that uh you 
you do have a choice which one gets produced if you spend a level one slot or higher right and all of these elixirs require an action which makes them a bit wonky in combat in terms of action economy but that only means you have to figure out what works the best for your party composition and luckily you have a lot of flexibility in that regard because these six options actually allow you to choose obviously between six different types of uh, elixirs and um, depending on what your party needs the more you can make uh, an educated choice in that regard healing right away is kind of weird in a sense that it provides more healing per first level spell slots on third and fourth level strictly speaking 2d4 plus your intelligence modifier for a first level slot is better than cure wounds which is a 1d6 plus intelligence or even healing word which is a 1d4 plus intelligence the bad the the downside obviously is that it requires an action from the creature that wants to heal her or, or himself um, that said, this character is gonna have access to a lot of free elixirs and this might not even... This is definitely something that's gonna be useful. Maybe not the most useful thing, but it's probably gonna be the most often useful thing if you, if you catch my drift, right? So, from level 5 to 8, Alchemical Savant is kind of like a, a feature that directly makes the healing elixir kind of weaker because now all of your healing spells basically you add your intelligence modifier on top of the uh hit points that you restore with your uh, with your spells so that means your 1d4 plus intelligence healing word just on its own becomes 1d4 plus intelligence plus intelligence one more time basically doubles the intelligence modifier so from level 5 to 8 that's kind of what makes the healing uh, elixir weaker but then at level 9 you get restorative reagents reagents i forgot to google that again so i guess i'm just gonna have to pronounce it incorrectly feature stacks additional temporary hit points making the healing elixir better again because 2d6 plus your intelligence modifier plus 2d4 plus your intelligence modifier that's a lot of additional hit points with just one first level spell slot right so you kind of have to be a little bit more careful in terms of how you uh, deal with this particular elixir. Swiftness is basically marginally better long strider because it's pretty much the same effect. Uh, the only benefit is that it cannot be counterspelled or dispelled because, well, obviously it's not a spell, it's an elixir, right? Resilience um, is passably good for lower armor class squishies in, in the back, especially when they get attacked or ambushed. But, um, you know, even though they have to waste their action, it might sometimes be something that uh, you might be considering, you know, especially if you have some AC-12 sorcerer in the back, you know, who are just, you know, two hits from goblins and he's at zero hit points. So it depends on your party composition, as I said, right? Boldness is kind of like one third of a bless spell without concentration. As such, it makes the most sense on fighters, if you ask me, because it still requires an action to, to use. So they can use their action surge to use boldness, and then immediately after that, obviously, use their regular action, or actually vice versa, right? So on lower levels, it definitely makes sense for fighters, but on higher levels, it's not the worst thing to have all of your party members have in their pockets, because passing saving throws becomes super important you know the higher you, the higher level you go less and less monsters rely on attack rolls instead they rely on abilities and spells that inflict some kind of saving throw mechanics where you either get damaged you know incapacitated stun or whatever so that's definitely something that makes uh, makes better sense at higher levels flight is probably universally the best one to make if you ask me because 10 minute duration allows more opportunities to use before rolling initiative in combat and makes all the ranged weapons and spells based characters harder to pin down a lot of monsters in fifth edition are actually melee based so they actually have to get in your face and just smack you so if you give this to some of your ranged based characters they can just fly around even though the flight speed is not much it's just enough that they get 
a decent height before the monster gets to them and then they can just um, kite them that way. So yeah, I definitely think this is a useful in that regard and I also think due to decent amount of uh, time that it that this effect lasts it can also be used out of combat as well transformation can be also super juicy because shorter duration of the alter self spell which usually lasts one hour is um compensated by the fact that you don't have to concentrate on it so it can help in water-based survival scenarios you can breathe underwater social intrigue settings where you can change your appearance or simply as a combat buff because you know, you can, those, uh, Alter Self pretty much gives you the, or I don't even know, yeah, so, 1d6 bludgeoning, piercing, unarmed strike, so this is kind of like, very good on monks, but any character pretty much at, at lower levels, because these are considered magical weapons, and they have a plus one bonus to attack and damage rolls you make, uh, using this part particular spell effect, so, that's it about the elixirs, right? R now we know that these elixirs are actually quite potent. The downside is that you have to spend your own uh, first level slots if you want to control which ones you give yourself or your party members. Now, obviously in order to gain more mileage out of this, we need something else. But before we go into that... Let's go back to the core class features. So at level four, you get your you get your ability score improvement. At level six um, and level level four eight, you get your ability score improvements. So, you know, I'd go for intelligence as I as I said uh, again. But you don't really you know you know you don't really need feats. You can take warcaster. I would just personally prefer prefer intelligence. Why? Because you know, you get Alchemical Savant back to the subclass, you know, it goes off of your Intelligence modifier. Then your level 7 feature, Flash of Genius, also goes off of your uh, Intelligence modifier. You also gain the Tool Expertises, which I didn't list in this list, but obviously, I mean, it's self-explanatory. What you get, all of your Tool Proficiencies, you have uh, your Proficiency Bonus doubles for them, but also... That goes back to that uh, house agent background, which gives you more tool proficiencies. And in that regard, you can get more out of this particular uh, feature. So, synergy between the background, race, subclass, and multiclass. So that we can get multiple, you know, angles of how to maximize the effectiveness of this, of this character concept. So, yeah, like Flash of Genius, again, another intelligence modifier uh, um, based feature. It's quite potent, saving throw buff, another reason to go, obviously, for intelligence, so that's it, yeah. And finally, at level 9, you get restorative reagents, reagents, I don't know how it's pronounced, you just, just correct me in the comments down below if you know, because I just keep forgetting how to check it. So, um, yeah, all of your elixirs now provide temporary hit points upon use, and you get a number of lesser restoration castings for free, without preparing the spell without expending a spell slot up to your intelligence modifier so this is another feature that uses your intelligence mod so you can see how bumping just increasing your intelligence up to 20 is pretty much probably the better option instead of just going always going for feats right and now that we kind of know what we get with with nine levels in artificer which pretty much this build revolves around let's go and see how we can actually maximize the one feature which we kind of are going to rely the most on and that's by going two levels into warlock and if you wonder which particular patron again it's the hex blade but it's not for the reasons that it's usually the case it's actually because first and foremost any warlock gets packed magic that means that their spell slots which they only have a couple of uh, are a short rest dependent feature however going back to your race high elf or any elf in that regard which enables you to have long rest benefits with just four hours of this deeply meditative semi-conscious state that you you know have to spend your time in pretty much means that you have four additional hours every adventuring day where you can do anything you want right and in this particular case with Pact Magic, 
you you will have for these four additional hours uh, while everybody else is taking their long rest this means you can have basically you can spend every hour short resting for four hours so that's that means four for four consecutive short rests and at the beginning of each short rest you pretty much spend your two uh, warlock spell slots right at level two of your warlock you gain another spell slot of level one and you know after that you pretty much spend them and you have two elixirs you wait another hour you spend slots you gain two more elixirs so this amounts to a total of eight extra elixirs on top of the ones that you can make with your artificer spell slots don't forget your artificer also gives you the the spell slots now you don't have a lot of them and it's pretty much maybe better to at least conserve some of them but at your third level of artificer you have third you have three level one artificer slots now these are obviously long rest dependent but i mean if you choose you can go all the way in with them right so you can have up to 14 elixirs every day uh, you get one one random and 13, one, uh, actually, yeah, no, 12 elixirs because 3 plus 1, yeah. So, 12 elixirs, one is random, one, 11 ones that you can choose which ones you, you take. So, that's actually a lot of utility, a lot of support that you can pro provide with just combining the warlock pack magic, any warlock pack magic, with uh, experimental elixirs from Artificer and... Uh, fueled by the four hour long rests of the high elf race right so that's pretty much the critical component of this build but obviously hexblade gives you some other features if you've been playing the game you know that hex warrior is kind of the feature that most people go for in this particular case you kind of already know that that's not the case we don't really even need charisma in this build the only way the only reason to go even this high in charisma is because we need at least 13 to multi-class into a warlock however one thing that you do get is a shield spell obviously plus five bonus to your ac as a reaction it's the best defensive uh, level one spell in the game especially on lower levels it's the one that you're gonna be using often all the time pretty much every combat most likely so you can manage without it if you want to go for these other patrons it's not it doesn't mean like you really need it but in terms of the optimal choice unfortunately even though hexblade is literally everywhere it still makes the most sense just for this spell alone which no other uh, warlock has access to so obviously Hex Warrior and Hexblade's Curse, not that important. Hexblade's Curse is gonna increase your damage slightly. So you are gonna be more relevant in terms of your damage output. But re regardless of that, your primary role with this type of character is to support your parties, to give them more utility and all of that uh, fancy stuff. Now in terms of Eldritch Invocations, which you also gain at level 2, uh, you get the choices that you can make there's only a couple of those uh, on the list that don't require any level or any of these uh, other things spells uh, boons whatever i personally i would go with eldritch sight because you can cast detect magic at will and this can be quite annoying for dms that like hiding magic items in weird places or pretty much like re like depending on all sorts of magical effects to screw with your party and pretty much this invocation allows you as you can see to cast it at will so it's pretty much always on right wherever you go your detect magic is always active if you lose concentration you just cast it again i think this is one of the best uh, invocations that don't require any prerequisites in terms of levels or features or spells and it kind of makes sense for the type of character that you uh, go with I would also probably go with Mask of Many Faces because you can turn... So think about this, right? You can literally turn into a snake oil salesman that goes around selling his own elixirs uh, for fat profits, scamming unsuspecting NPCs in the process because the elixirs lose potency after your long rest, right? So basically, like, you can... I mean, Okay, so first and foremost, if you're gonna do that, you're definitely not a lawful character, you're at the very least neutral, 
because that's kind of obviously illegal, whatever, all of that stuff. But that's just something funny that you can do, right? And obviously that's one idea, right? Obviously being able to disguise yourself, change your appearance at will. This has many, many uses with some creativity and depending on the circumstances. This is usually one of the invocations that breaks a lot of social encounters that DMs like to throw at you and your party. Because you can just pretend to be somebody else, right? So either if you're running away from the law, pretending to be a king or a police officer or something like that, this invocation is always going to be very, very useful. With that, sped, let's, uh, with that said, let's quickly go over some of these um, spells. Now for the Artificer, I would go with Guidance because, I mean, it's literally one of the best support utility spells in the game 1d4 to all ability checks of your choice for the next minute even though it's a concentration this is there's not very many ways to increase your numbers in or when you roll uh, d20 other than proficiency expertise and guidance so why would you not take it right sure you can take mending if you have communculus live as long as possible i'm gonna talk about it real soon but I don't think it's entirely necessary, especially if you don't even go for the, you know, little tiny servant made out of all sorts of weird parts. Fireball, Firebolt, obviously, for the damage. Uh, it's the relevant damage type anyway, and most average damage, uh, it provides the most average damage and synergizes with your alchemical swan feature, which provides even a little bit more than most other characters get out of this country. Uh, in terms of Warlock cantrips, no, I'm not going for Eldritch Blast. Why would you ever go for Eldritch Blast with this build when your Charisma is going to be at max 14 and your Intelligence 20, right? So you pretty much need to rely on your Intelligence for any offensive cantrips. So for Warlock, I would pretty much go with some Utility, Support, whatever you want to consider it. Minor Illusion is always, always useful. And in the uh, hands of a creative player, uh, is very, very potent but uh, first one the prestidigitation is more straightforward it has more text like it's less ambiguous in terms of what you can do so uh, yeah it provides more straightforward utility mage hand kind of makes sense because oftentimes you might might actually want to hand your elixirs in a hurry even if your allies aren't right next to you so you pretty much use your mage hand you give the elixirs elixir to some party member which is like within 30 feet of you so yeah it can be quite nifty in a in a in a, in a pinch in terms of level one spells so uh, let me just quickly set it up so artificer obviously absorb elements elemental damage is quite common in the game so better take this as, uh, you know better take as little of that damage as possible identify makes sense because the character of this caliber has to know what type of magic he's dealing with Fairy Fire uh, is also very potent because in combat providing your allies with advantage on their attack rolls is often the best thing a support class, a support type of character like this can even do. Uh, in terms of Warlock spells, obviously you get Shield, you still have to learn it. Now it's not on this list, it's pretty much uh, a subclass, subclass type of spell, I mean it's, we already talked about it. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's always good protection from evil and good inflicting disadvantage against all these creature types when they try to attack you is sometimes and oftentimes a a a the best defensive countermeasure in your arsenal for just a measly first level spell slot. Comprehend languages, you kind of need, you kind of need to understand languages because going for intelligence type of character usually revolves around you being more on the side of you know reading books and stuff like that so oftentimes dms like to throw books at weird languages so you have to understand like languages in order to read those books right so that's why i think and in most cases this is the spell that often comes up into play in actual like practical gameplay scenarios once we go to level two spells it's pretty much only artificer so in that case it's kind of like a blur that first comes to mind because just in case protection from evil and good doesn't work you know maybe you're being attacked by a humanoid make yourself harder to hit and give give your enemies disadvantage on their attack rolls aid is not 
as good with delayed spell progression. Uh, clerics get it at level 3, you get it at level 5. But this is still one of the top tier support spells in the game. And I've seen many paladins still prepare it. And why would you not do the same? Now, invisibility, obviously, um, many utility options uh, with this type of spell. You know, uh, sneaking around, uh, scouting... You know, just trying to pass, uh, sleeping, sleeping next to guards and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, obviously all of that stuff. So, that's it for the invisibility rope trick. Um, well, look, it's you don't really have to take this spell, but panic button for, sh for safer short rests is sometimes the thing that you and your party needs. And especially in your case, due to the fact that you're so much short rest dependent... Uh, the very least that you can do with this is just make two more elixirs and sometimes you know those two elixirs can actually do quite a bit uh, at the very least heal your party members for 2d4 plus whatever you know so yeah web is uh, okay so I do like restraint condition and even though this spell doesn't really cover that much of, a, of, of an area it's a 20 foot cube it's still decent enough for a second level spell uh, to help your party have advantage. To, the, the creature has disadvantage and all of that fancy stuff. And obviously if you have uh, some party member who fireballs everything in its path, uh, the creature creatures affected by this spell will have disadvantage on their deck saving throws. So this is going to be uh, good in that regard as well. Level 3 spells, uh, it's pretty much the ones that you get at level 9. So blink... A lot of spells are actually, they make sense uh, in order to, in order of how much they, how much power they give you. So nothing bad can happen if you are not even there. Uh, this is a luck based spell. You roll a d20 on a roll of 11 or higher, you vanish. So it's pretty much a coin toss. Um, but if you do roll 11 or higher, you are not even there. So nobody can damage you. Nobody can do anything to you, right? So... Um, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much the best defensive spell in the game, or at least one of the best ones for the type of thing, type of effect that you can get out of it, and the level of the spell, uh, spell slot required to cast. This spell magic, always good, because even though you get it very late, you are a half caster, you still get it at level 9. It's a generic solution for many problematic spells and the effects that you and your party members have to deal with. Haste, uh is going to be the spell that your paladins, rogues and barbari barbarians will love you for when you cast this spell on them because it gives them more action, more speed, more attacks, all of that stuff. Revivify, now you don't really need this especially if you have a cleric in your party but your alchemy becomes so advanced that you can now pull them back from the de dead for a short period of the time. So yeah, I mean, you can help your allies not die, even if they, you know, or at least come back to life if they are if they are already dead. So, um, yeah, especially if you're the only one who, who even has access to this spell, I would consider it as something that you kind of, uh, you know, you need to have prepared in your arsenal. So, let's go to these infusions, right? The first one that I would definitely say you kind of need, really is the enhanced enhanced arcane focus why because in order to cast warlock spells you need a uh, arcane focus which is a rod staff or wand or orb or something else but pretty much can be all of these three things and going back to artificer uh, to the core class feature infuse item or spell casting which for some reason the dnd beyond doesn't let me click um, you can use infusions to cast your spells once you learn them and have them active. So in this particular case, once you uh, enhance these rods, staffs or wands, which you can use for warlock spells, you can also use them for your artificer spells and you gain a bonus to your um, accuracy, which isn't that important for you, but still, I mean, you're going to hit a little bit more uh, often. So yeah, that's good. Enhanced defense, not mandatory, but higher AC al always means that you're harder to hit. Uh, replicate magic item. Now, alchemy jug is something that clearly makes the most thematic sense. Um, it's always useful when you and your party find themselves running low on water. And 
it fits the alchemist theme perfectly bag of holding i mean it has been tried and tested for hauling party loot and managing excess weight so definitely something that i would uh, consider now you can learn some of these other ones but if you ask me i would pretty much consider homunculus servant at least learn it you don't have to have it active at all times even though it's weaker it's a weakened version of the unearthed arcana alchemist homunculus whatever servant it was called uh it has lower ac lower hit points and less things that it can do it still offers a decent bonus action damage you know if you just if you have nothing else you can do this and you can cast spells through it you can always use it to scout ahead and all of that stuff so i think it's it there's decent amount of utility you get you can gain out of it and all the other options that i think it's uh, uh it, it makes sense to learn it right and finally repulsion shield you know you don't really have that many offensive features so i think you have to kind of like double or triple down on your defenses and this magical infusion infused item which you need to be a six level artificer to to get is uh, gonna further increase your armor class and also allow you to push the attackers up to 15 feet away which obviously with four charges you're gonna have plenty of uses of these there is a little bit of a randomness because sometimes if you spend all four charges you can only gain one of them back daily at dawn but usually like you're gonna be able to accumulate charges through the uh, course of the campaign and uh, yeah that's it for the infusions in terms of progression it's pretty simple right i don't wanna you know bore you with details i pretty much go to first three levels of artificer to get those uh to get this arcane um enhanced arcane focus and experimental elixirs first then you go to warlock two levels in warlock to get the shield spell and to get the uh, short less short rest level one spell slots and finally I mean, go back to Artificer, you know, get the higher level features, better spells, and all of that stuff. And finally, once you hit level 9, you, all of your elixirs provide 2d6 plus intelligence modifier temporary hit points. So, that's it about uh, this particular build. You can go all the way up to Artificer level 15, because, you know, you get this chemical mastery, and if you think about it, with a free casting of Greater Restoration, you can negate one exhaustion level, right? So, I'm not sure if I even have access to this. I need to unlock a lot of these spells on D&D Beyond, but hey, it costs. So, um, yeah, you can end one of these. Uh, it's, I think it's, it's somewhere in there. Uh, yeah, you can reduce the target's exhaustion level by one. So, by skipping a long rest, you get... Uh, you get one level of exhaustion, but you can pretty much deny that level through the use of Greater Resto. So this can effectively allow you to have 16 extra elixirs ready every two days. Because if you think about it, instead of spending just four hours short resting and making two elixirs every hour, now you can spend eight hours making two elixirs every hour. So that's 16. Eight times two is 16. So... I wouldn't really advise doing that at, as higher level spells and features usually are more important than just doubling or tripling down on your lower level features. But it's definitely an option if you want to do it. And um, yeah, I mean, why not? So that's pretty much it, guys. Uh, if you like this video, like, share, comment, subscribe, hit the bell button, you know the YouTube drill. This pretty much helps my channel grow in ways that, you know, the YouTube algorithm pretty much knows, but nobody else knows. So, yeah, it's been working so far. Thank you for interacting with my channel. Uh, keep doing it. Uh, you pretty much don't need to do anything else than, well, do that. And for that, I'm going to be eternally grateful if you choose to grace me with a little bit of your clicks and time. Anyway. I'm going to invite you once again to consider pledging on my uh, Patreon, right? So, the Magical Secrets is going to give you access to this particular build. All of the files and notes which you've just seen me talk over uh, and about in the video. For your future reference and convenience, it's not mandatory, but the option is always there. And also, once again, if you want to play in my home campaign, homebrew campaign online... Uh, there is a 33.33% .33 Black Friday discount and definitely uh, it's the 
kind of like shh, it's a limited time offer so definitely you know enter your details let me know your schedule and whether you have any experience with this and i'm gonna get in touch get back in touch with you uh, tell you what days and what hours are actually available so yeah do that if you're interested and uh with that said min max munch king out and talk to you soon <laughs>